So, hello. This is a talk about Linux distributions. Uh, I see there are any people coming, so I hope you have read the abstract uh, and have correct expectations. Uh, So uh, I'm Michal Koutny, I uh, work at SUSE in a kernel team, uh, but uh, this talk is not related to my job at SUSE at all. I've just used the email address because it can be public. So uh, com the computers, uh, they are precise, accurate machines, so they should be deterministic. So uh, I was wondering uh, where does the randomness come from. So uh, if we have something random on computer, so usually it's a pseudo random and it's generated uh, by a pseudo random number generator. Uh, in like very rough uh, explanation, uh, it is a process where we have some internal state of the generator that is initiated uh, by a seed and then we have a function that transitions from one state uh, to another state, and while it transitions, it generates uh, a byte, which should be random, or, uh, yeah, that's, that's the random how we have it. So, uh, the, of course, it's, the function is deterministic, so it uh, depends on how random the state actually is, and, uh, and uh, if we have a, a limited set of uh, the possible states, so if we ever get into the same state, uh, so we have the same sequence of the random bytes. So uh, the, the, there's a period of the generator depending on the number of uh, elements in the set of states. Uh, sometimes we also distinguish pseudo-random generator that is some, just something like this. And sometimes we have some special requirement uh, for uh, for the generator for cryptographic purposes. And in that case, the set of states is uh, larger and the function is uh, more complicated so that the internal state of the generator cannot be guessed, uh, cannot be guessed from the output of the generator. Uh, so, so here it's still quite deterministic in a sense that it depends only on the seed. But in the Linux kernel, we sometimes, well, sometimes, I mean uh, regularly or uh, randomly, we randomly add some external entropy to the internal state. Uh, and uh, this external entropy can come from hardware random number generators, uh, those are specific devices, or uh, from various events uh, that happen in the system and their timings. Uh, so this is basically all I wanted to have in this talk about the random numbers generation in Linux, because uh, there is a talk from Jason Donnerfeld uh, linked here on the slides. Uh, the slides can be downloaded from the site, site of the conference. And uh, there he explains uh, the history, uh, the new design and implementation of the cryptographically cryptographical random number generator in the Linux kernel. And that was released in version 6.2, that means uh, this year's spring. So uh, now to the distributions. Uh, so uh, maybe you know or don't know, uh, depends uh, whether you have some statistic classes, uh, what the distributions are. Uh, I don't want to be this just formulas that describe the distributions, but also some explanation of the context uh, where the distributions occur uh, in real life. So first we start with some definition of a random variable. Uh -huh. So I will not give here the full definition, uh, the rigorous one, just uh, some classification that we have discrete or continuous uh, random variables. So that is whether we have some, uh, uh, for example, integers as uh, random numbers or some real numbers. Uh, what is the most important thing about the random variable is its uh, probability density function or it's the distribution function. They are like uh, related to each other. 
And then there are some characteristics of uh, random variables, like modus, median, and mean, and uh, variance. Uh, these are the most common. Uh, most common is modus. Uh, I just want to put it here in the talk that mean uh, or the average value is uh, a special value among uh, when you want to estimate. Sorry, when you want to estimate uh, mean of a distribution. So this estimate think value is such a value that minimizes sum of squares uh, for individual samples. So sum of squares, maybe you've heard something like that uh, before. It's like the derivation of the mean. So interestingly, median is minimizer of uh, sum of uh, first powers in absolute value, and modus is minimizer of uh, zeroth powers of absolute values. So this is just for thinking for you. It's not so much related to Linux. So uh, the first basic distribution is uniform distribution, uh, which here on the picture we have it. Uh, we have it in the continuous form, uh, where it assigns the same probability to every number in a given interval between the boundaries A and B. Uh, we can have a discrete version of uh, the distribution, for example, coin flip or rolling a dice, are also uh, uniform distributions. Uh, interesting thing about this is that uh, that's the distribution that has maximum entropy. Uh, we'll, tell, we'll explain the practical impact of that later. So now, uh, my favorite exponential distribution. Exponential distribution, uh, or its discrete counterpart, geometric distribution, uh, represents the number of uh, coin flips that we have to carry out before we see a success. So imagine we have a coin uh, that uh, has some probability p that we are winning. Uh, so we are asking how many times we have to flip the coin before we see the first winning. So uh, the, such, such, a, such a number has, is a random variable and has an exponential or geometric distribution, depending on how we uh, define it precisely. It has one interesting property, which is called memorylessness. Uh, that means that the probability uh, doesn't depend on the current state or neither the history. So it's always the uh, same, or it does, doesn't have any internal state dis distribution. We can also uh, use it to ex express uh, inter-arrival times of requests on a server. When we consider, for example, uh, because if we have like no other information about the system, we can think uh, about uh, clients flipping a coin and every minute or every second, and if they win, so they make a request on the server. And uh, uh, if we have uh, such client, so it just randomly connects to the server, uh, the times between requests would have exponential distribution. Uh, the, the distribution has parameter, parameter, parameter lambda, and uh, that represents the rate or the requests per second, and uh, the mean average value of this distribution is the reciprocal of, uh, of the rate. So it's, it is actually yeah, the average time between the requests. Now, uh, two other distributions named after mathematicians they are, uh, is related to exponential distribution. First of them is a discrete distribution, it's Poisson distribution, that uh, tells us if you look at the requests process uh, in different way, uh, basically we are asking how many requests do we get in a certain unit of time. So uh, that would have Poisson distribution. And we see that the mean value here is the actual lambda, the rate that we had before, the number of requests per second, that's the average. And, uh, Erlang distribution that uh, occurs when we stack a multiple exponential distributions uh, behind 
each other. That means uh, if we have a server that has a queue of k requests, um, and each request has exponential distribution of its processing time, here I'm talking about processing time, so if there are k requests before uh, in our incoming request, so it will have the waiting time will have a long distribution, uh, a long distribution of yeah, waiting time in the queue. So that's again on the picture, uh, visible in the picture. Now another important distributions uh, that should be in everyone's tool set or tool, yeah, tool set uh, is a binomial distribution. That is, we we had. First, we had single coin, but that we are flipping it, uh, which is sometimes called also Bernoulli distribution. And if we have n coins, and we are asking like how many coins are winning, so uh, s such a uh, such a random variable would have binomial distribution. And on average, if we have n coins and coin is winning on average with probability p, uh, the mean value of this distribution would be uh, p times n. So here, uh, it is like a building step towards much more important and more famous distribution that is on the right. That's normal distribution or Gauss distribution, which is uh, extension of uh, binomial distributions uh, to infinite number of variables, where we uh, sum them as with the coins, uh, and actually uh, they can have almost any distribution. Uh, it's not, uh, it, there are some special conditions on that, but like for some w good behaving distributions, it doesn't matter if we have infinite such variables and uh, sum them, the resulting variable would have normal distribution. And wh why is it so important? Because many times uh, we have some phenomenons that depend on many, uh, many small uh, coin flips or many small uh, random contributor contributors uh, and the the, the the result of these contributors uh, is normally distributed so yeah we will have some uh, practical example later and another distribution which uh, I'm I don't, it's not my favorite one, but uh, it is uh, perhaps interesting because it's derived from empirical observation, which is a Zipf's, Zipf's law uh, that uh, tells us how frequencies of words are distributed in natural language. Basically, if we take a text, analyze the unique different words that are in the text, uh, cal calculate their frequencies, sort it, so the, the function the, uh, from the rank to the probability will be basically one over n, or some constant over n. So on the right hand side the, in the picture, we see it's basically a straight line because that's a log log plot. And yeah, uh, actually, how, wh why did I actually why did I enter it to this talk? Because okay, yeah, there is natural language everywhere, uh, so not specific to Linux. But I figured out that uh, uh, FIO, which is a benchmark for I/O benchmarking, actually uh, can generate read or write random requests with this distribution, which could, for example, mean that. Uh, yeah, we have some pages in the file, and maybe at the beginning are like the most frequently used pages, and uh, if they are generated with similar process, uh, like the words, so that would represent some real workload. But I'm not sure the, why, why it was added to the file benchmark. It, was not it is not explained in changelog. So th that was the theoretical or a theoretical build up. Now we will look at some pictures from real world. Uh, if you had questions, uh, don't hesitate. Just raise your hand and ask. So I talk at the start about random bytes. But sometimes, uh, or oftentimes, uh, we 
require for some numerical simulations random number in range in a range from zero to one. But if uh, you consider how floating numbers are represented uh, on computers, so actually not all bits uh, of, of, the, of the binary representation have the same meaning. We see on this picture in the left, uh, left bottom corner that the red bits are the actual mantissa that have like the classical integer representation and then the green bits are an exponent which, which actually uh, doubles the number with every value. Uh, uh, so if we just generated uh, random bytes and interpreted them as a floating point number, we would get the distribution that's on the histogram on the right hand side. And we will see that actually yeah, there is like, here I generated 100,000 numbers and like almost, it's not even visible in the picture, but almost like all of them, 100,000, uh, were, uh, were very close to zero. So this is not how you get uniformly distributed floating point numbers. You must, yeah, how it is implemented in the libraries is that they actually generate only the part for, for the mantissa. So even though you have here, like you have, uh, you have uh, here, the example is 32 bits float number. So if you have 32 bits, so the random part can only be uh, 23 bits in this case. So another, another situation where we use random numbers in Linux is uh, address space layout randomization. Uh, you can look at the proc self maps, which is a special file that represents uh, memory maps present in a process itself. So that's like reflection API for the process itself. And you can see that if you invoke it uh, two times uh, after each other, so you see that the actual address of the heap uh, is different, although the address of the stack is different every time. Uh, similar, uh, yeah, every time. And that's uh, to make it more difficult for attackers uh, to guess where the data on the heap or on the stack are, so that they cannot just uh, roll one exploit and rely on some fixed addresses. Uh, similarly, also, uh, the distribution, the Linux distributions, the real distributions, uh, cannot also roll code with hard-coded addresses. So I just here put an example that if we have code pages, they are also mapped randomly, so you, have, you need position-independent code to, for that to work. And also kernel itself is randomized. The, the code and uh, the data of kernel in memory are put on a random location, and that is depending on, uh, uh, that is, specific for each boot. You can check it again, but for example, by the address of the symbol underscore text, and you see that's a privileged operation because yeah, non-privileged users should not, should not be able to easily guess location of the kernel in memory. Now, uh, this is a very important slide because if there is anything uh, you, I would like you to remember from this talk, so it's a BPF trace which is very cool utility uh, that uh, historically it's similar to D-Trace on Solaris, uh, or if you don't know D-Trace, uh, it's a combination of uh, uh, AWK, uh, AWK, AWK, and uh, BPF. You can, you can hook to various events in the Linux kernel, also like dynamic events that are not prepared in advance, and uh, then you write rules to process them. So here, here is, for example, a simple program that is hooked into a scheduler tick function and calculates the delta time that it took from the previous invocation of the function. And it's done on each CPU separately, and then all these data are put into a histogram. That's the, it's all very useful built-ins in BPF trace. If we do this, so we see that there is something like normal distribution where, as I told you, uh, there are like some contributing factors that make the tick be slightly delayed or uh, slightly expedited. Uh, so in all together, uh, it should sum up as a normal distribution. So we see that the peak of the normal distribution or the mean value is around uh, 300 
sorry, around uh, 3.3 milliseconds. No, uh, basically, what I want to say, this is on kernel with 300 hertz scheduler tick. And the, the values are in, in nanoseconds here. And we also see there is like a big outlier group, and it, that is when the CPU is actually idle. It's not uh, ticking. So this is sim with the simple BPF trace command. Another uh, demonstration here is use of a special synthetic event interval that happens, uh, in this case, every 500 milliseconds. And here I calculated the equals of the function at interrupt randomness, which is the one that uh, contributes to the entropy of the pool. And the idea here was that it should have Poisson distribution. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's not Poisson distribution. So that means that actually the invocations of, uh, of this function are not memoryless process. But again, very easy to verify this hypothesis with BPF trace. For the ZIP's law, uh, here I just wanted to try it with uh, slash def slash u random. And uh, uh, here I used the traditional uh, Unix text processing utilities. So the TR command, that's where the magic is, where we transform the random bytes to words of uh, four letter alphabet plus space. And then we do some post-processing. We get the list of most common words. So we see short words, most frequent. And what should have been like the straight line is somehow with steps, uh, because uh, yeah, uh, it's not a natural language. It is just random string uh, f uh, flowing from def random. So that I apply the same for the text file. That's the Linux documentation. We see that like quite a straight line, that's the natural language, that follows the Zips law. Here, uh, although Zips law is related to Pareto distribution, Pareto distribution should represent sizes of uh, some objects that occur naturally. So here I tried to evaluate it on kernel memory objects, whether it would follow the Zips law. Here you see that it's not a nice line, so in this case it did not apply, but here, if I applied that to files on the root file system with the command at the bottom, so you can see that at least that's in some range, uh, it follows the zips law, the sizes of files on the file system. Maybe you can uh, remember it through the Pareto law, that basically like 80% uh, of uh, file system is occupied by 20% of files, but uh, yeah, this, the, the, this is the this is the popular Pareto law. There is one more thing I want to mention, uh, and that is uh, where we have also normal distribution uh, as a well, yeah. What I want to mention is where we, when the randomness, the random parameter somehow depends affects the random parameter is some security data. And uh, we saw that uh, the timing of an operation may be affected by many factors, but because of the normal distribution, eventually it, it would still be visible uh, what the secret parameter was. So here we have some t timings of um, operation on a CPU that in, some, in one case was cached, in second case it was uncached. And the, whether it was cached or not cached was depending on a secret bit. And yeah, that's something called transmit gadget. So, and we can measure latency uh, of this operation also via network, where we add even more contributing factors. And then we get something like this, which is a picture from the paper about vulnerability called NetSpectre, where uh, the timings of the operations uh, were measured 100,000 times, maybe a million times, uh, to extract the secret value from the computer, because uh, some operation depended on the secret value. Uh, but also, as I said, it was, I don't know, millions of samples, and you get one byte. So these extraction side channel uh, attacks are quite low bandwidth. Yep. Uh, this was something about birthday paradox or birthday attack, maybe sometimes you notice that the bigger repository you have, the longer abbreviated commit hashes are. 
because there is more, uh, there is a higher probability of collisions. So it's just to illustrate that effect. So that was last, uh, yeah, APIs, random APIs that you can use uh, in the C language or in JavaScript. Again, beware the difference between uh, pseudo-random numbers and cryptographically secure pseudo-random numbers. Uh, so take care when you uh, take care of it when you have your use case. These are uh, kernel APIs, uh, as I said, from v6.2. So the other references, yeah, I had many other ideas to put into the talk, uh, so not all of them are here. Uh, you can check the links, and that is all. Thank you for attention. So anyone has a question about Linux distribution? Okay, good.